Welcome this evening to our program. This is jointly sponsored by the French Institute and the Scowcroft Institute, which are both within the Bush School of Government. We'd like to welcome Dean Mark, Wel uh, Mark Welch, who's just back from Africa, from a safari in uh, Tanzania, right? He has his own stories, but that's not for this evening. <laughs> uh, and uh, we don't have a banner for the, 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 the French Institute yet, but we're gonna have one of those made at some point. So I actually was uh, in Rwanda just after the genocide, and I, as a vice president of World Vision, the faith-based NGO, this was uh, in uh, 1994, and I'm actually gonna tell you several stories of what I saw. I am not gonna go through the explanation of what happened and why it happened, and I actually did some writing myself 30 years, 25 years ago on this, but uh, I'll let you leave that to the scholars here to describe what happened. But uh, World Vision is the, probably the largest NGO in the world with 40,000 employees and a $3 billion budget. Uh, they're enormous, and they, had, they were the NGO that was behind the rebel leader, Kagame, who's now the president of uh, Rwanda's army as it was uh, coming from um, Uganda into Rwanda, the World Vision humanitarian relief staff were just behind them going into the villages where people were displaced or hungry, trying to feed them and all that. And so I went in to see, this is after the genocide, I think it was about a month, two, two or three months after the genocide. And there are three stories I'll tell you briefly. I stayed with the U.S. ambassador, Ambassador Rawson, who who was a missionary kid. He was brought up, uh, uh, born and brought up in Rwanda, spoke in Rwanda fluently, and that's one of the reasons he was chosen to be there. And he invited me, because of his relationship with World Vision, to stay at the residence with him. And I met his driver, who was a Rwandan, and his driver told me this story. He said, my wife and children, when I went back home during the genocide, disappeared. And I, I don't know if they were slaughtered or anything, but I've spent every single day after hours going to the camps because a million, uh, Hutu, mostly Hutus, went, left Rwanda after Kagame, who was a Tutsi, took over uh, and they went into Eastern Congo, just over the border into these massive refugee camps, one of which was being run by World Vision. They had about 60,000 people in it in these little um, tents that they all had and we were feeding them and it was, uh, it was utter chaos. But I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm methodically going through each camp trying to find my wife and children because I don't know whether they were slaughtered. I can't find their bodies anywhere. I don't know what happened to them. And the ambassador told me that he, he a lot of people were astonished that the Rwandans had been all this, through all this and didn't seem uh, um, depressed. And, and, and Rawson said, Andrew, I think 60% of the country is severely clinically depressed. He said, I'm not a psychiatrist, but you can tell by people's behavior. But they were internalizing it in a way that was remarkable. I went into the camps the next day, and I'll never forget, I met a nine-year-old boy. World Vision was taking care of him. Um, his name was Simeon Jean-Baptiste. I remember his name. And he was uh, emaciated from not e eating properly, and he had scabies, which is a skin infection from not being cleaned properly. His, he, I asked him his story, and he said, my father gave me money to go, just before the genocide started, literally the day it started, to go get bread for dinner. And when I went to the market, I brought the bed back, and my father and mother had been axed to death in their living room. And my brothers and sisters were all dead next to them, except for my sister who lived next door. I went to find my sister, and she was dead on the floor in a pool of blood, and her husband had gone out to get food, came back and found his wife dead. So the two of them went to the camp and his brother-in-law went off somewhere. And so the, the World Vision staff was matching up children with people who had lost their own children in this genocide. So this older woman had lost all her children and her husband. And so this little boy, it was an informal adoption. And they had been together for the two or three months, and she was trying to care for him under a horrendous situation. The kid was clearly emotionally traumatized. I could barely hear him speak. He was whispered the story to me. And, and, I, and, and the, the World Vision staff said the camp is full of tens of th hundreds of thousands of people with these same kinds of stories. 
The last story is that the next the following day, I went out into the countryside and I said, well, I, have, I, I know the odor of decomposing bodies because I've been to famines and civil wars and um, natural disasters all over the world. When there's mass numbers of people who've died, it, the smell of the decomposing is an overwhelming smell. In fact, I smelled it on the plane going back uh, even though it was clearly not in my clothes or anything, it gets into your nose, you can't get rid of it. It took me several weeks to get it out of my system, physically. Uh, I think part of it's trauma, I think my own trauma from seeing what I saw. So we went into one of these villages, and we went to a church. Now, in the, in the genocide in the 1960s, uh, the same thing took place, but people went into the churches for protection, and no one would dare to slaughter people in a church. This time... They were given orders, the, 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 the soldiers, uh, the, the uh, genocidaires who committed this, uh, these atrocities, were told the church is nothing, go in and kill them in the church. And what they did was they made the men dig their own grave, a mass grave, and then they shot all the men, dumped them in the grave that the men had actually made themselves, dug themselves, and the women and children were in the church for protection, and they went in and they took cutlasses, big Long, which they had, they had ordered a half a million cutlasses and people were suspicious as to why they came in from China three or four months before the genocide started because it had been planned out. And uh, the, the 900 women and children had been slaughtered in this church and their bodies were lying decomposing on the floor of the church. We could smell it two, month, two miles before. And many of them had been beheaded and they, they had taken the heads and put them on a giant table and and there was nothing, it was just the, the skull left of the heads, but um, the, the dresses of the children, I won't remember the dresses and the trousers of the little children, these are, some of them were infants, two or three years old or a year old, were on the floor with the bones because the animals would come in at night and eat the decomposing bodies along with the insects. So this is a scene, and this is a famous church because they preserved the church and what had happened so people who came could see the atrocities. I went back several months later to a prison that was holding, I, my memory is, was 50,000 people who were accused of committing the genocide. And I went in with Ron, Ryan, Lionel Rosenblatt, who is a uh, president of uh, Refugees International, which is an advocacy group, a human rights advocacy group, and the two of us went in, and I, I, I would never saw anything like it, because the, 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 the facility was designed for about 1,000 people, and there were 60,000 people in it. Uh, and and uh, uh, the conditions were, uh, they, the ICRC, the Committee, International Committee, had gone in to try to clean it up because people were dying of starvation in the camps. The Tutsis were, who, army that was controlling people from leaving the prison, wouldn't go inside because they would have been torn apart by the Hutus who were in the camp who were accused of the genocide. And they had elected a, 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 uh, a um, architect as the president and, uh, of the camp, of the prison. But these people are all people who have been accused, even if it was unfairly, with no evidence, of, of having participated in the genocide in the villages. And each of them had been arrested and put in the, and there were these large prisons. And the Gachacha trials were an attempt, actually, to deal with the situation of these prisons. Now, I, I know we have French here, but I, I have to tell you this story. So, the first thing they asked Lyle and I, are you French? I said, well, why, what difference does it make whether we're French? We're in here to see this. He said, well, if you're French, I would not come in here because they will tear you apart. They're blaming the French for this. And I said, well, Lyle and I said, no, we're Americans. He said, you're fine. You are not involved in this, and so um, uh, you can come in. And I, I remember they slept at night on their sides in rows on the ground. And then they would, every two hours, they would switch sides so that they could sleep on the other side because they'd get sore on the ground because there's no sleeping uh, stuff. And they would all do it in unison, back and forth. And they had a urinal, because <laughs> these were all men. They were, uh, it was a, 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 a barrel, an oil barrel. And th there were just lines of people in this giant barrel, and that, that was the facility for... Uh, so it was, there were scenes like this. It was like a scene out of hell for me. I, I keep telling stories. I said I would stop. But the last story is this. We went, when the genocide was going on, the, the senior executives of the NGOs, Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, the International Rescue Committee, Church World Service, uh, 
uh, AfriCares, and one other NGO, we went in to see the Pentagon and we said, Radio Mill Colleen is giving instructions, it's the national radio station, as to who to slaughter in which village by day. Uh, we said, and now my, my colleagues were pacifists, so they said, the Pentagon has the capacity to jam the broadcasts. I said, well, I'm not a pacifist. I was a lieutenant colonel in the reserves, and I had no compunction to use violence to stop this. I said, blow it up. We don't need to jam it. Just blow it up. It'll send a message to everyone. It'll slow down the genocide. And the colonel we were talking to, he privately pulled me aside. He said, sir, I know you're a colonel, and you and I share the same rank, and I just want to I'm embarrassed to tell you what I'm telling you, but we were told by the lawyers, you can, I thought it was outrageous. This is a violation of the First Amendment to break, a, to destroy a radio station. I said, one, the US Constitution does not apply to other countries. Number two, no one even in the United States would allow a, a radio station to be used as an instrument of genocide and use the Constitution to defend it. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine you're saying this thing. We were, went into a rage. We had a yelling match in the Pentagon with them. And it was not the military who tried to stop it. The military said, we'd do it in five minutes if they were, we were ordered to, but they wouldn't order them to do it. And so it wasn't done. And it could have been done and could have slowed the thing down. It wouldn't have stopped it, but it would have slowed it down. Now, I purge myself of this. I can sit down. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, my name is Joe Golson. I'm the director of the France TAMU Institute. Um, let me first begin by welcoming our guests this evening. Um, two of our guests from France are seated or to my left. Hélène Dumas is France's leading historian of the Rwandan genocide in contemporary Rwanda. She spends her time between France and Rwanda. In fact, I had the great pleasure of going with Hélène and one of her research groups to Rwanda right before Christmas. And I can tell you that it was one of the most moving and profound experiences of my life. Um, unfortunately, Stéphane Audouin Rousseau, um, our, our third speaker, was unable to make it tonight. So I've asked my colleague Nathan Brocker from the Department of International Studies to read his, his paper. Um, Stéphane Audouin Rousseau um, actually testified recently in France at the trials of Hutu killers who had escaped to France and were brought to justice in France. Um, Hélène is going to speak about two projects, I think, the Gachacha Trials, um, and also she's currently working on a project of children's memories of the genocide. Uh, last but certainly not least on my far left is Henri Rousseau, Henry Rousseau, and I'm happy to announce he is the Bush School's inaugural Hagler Fellow, um, and will be joining the faculty, he's here now, and will be joining the faculty in spring 2021. Um, Henri Rousseau has been to Rwanda, has written about it. His primary specialization is World War II and its memory in Europe. He is currently designing um, the National Museum on the History of Terror in France um, at, at the designation of President uh, Emmanuel Macron. I was gonna give you a little bit more background about the genocide, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll not give that and just mention a few details that are worth noting. The genocide began when the president, the Hutu president's plane was shot down in early April of uh, 1994. Rather than have a, a national mourning following that, the genocide which of Tutsis by the Hutus, which had been in planning for years, literally followed on the death of, of the president. The genocide lasted approximately three months until July 4th, I believe, 1994, when the Tutsi army liberated Kigali. It's important to stress that even today, the Hutus who fled, um, I believe a lot of them are in, in Congo, or in, uh, are, are essentially being remilitarized, refanatized one more time. So when you visit Rwanda, it's an incredibly happy, beautiful African country, but it's not like everyone who's there, who's of the age to have been alive then, isn't fully aware of what has happened. So on the one side hand, you see this kind of joyous African street life. On the other hand, there's a, a particular reserve that I think certainly among the older people um, that reflected um, what they had experienced. And as I was told by our guest who isn't here tonight, Stéphane Edouin Rousseau, who went with us to Rwanda, he said to me, everybody knows everything. These people all know, looking around them, they know who the neighbors were, they know who were the killers and who weren't. 
So with that, let me pass the, the baton to Ilan Dumas. Ilan. Yeah, thank you for, for the invitation, and thank you, Joe, for this introduction. Um, I will dedicate my presentation to the, the Gachacha Court, uh, because the, the Durandan judiciary process holds a very particular part among the other form of mass crime justice. Uh, indeed, we could condense the main principle of the Gachacha by this statement. The crime produces its own form of justice. Uh, Gachacha were not created from outside. They were especially reinvented to account for the massive event that represent the genocide against the Tutsi. And they don't rely on a previous institution or a legal corpus. In this regard, it's very different from the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was created by the UN in November 1994. So as you know, between, between April and July 1994, the Tutsi community in Rwanda became the target of a mass killing campaign, which was organized by the higher level of the state and mostly perpetrated, perpetrated by a large fringe of the civilian population. And the Hutu, who were opposed to the violence, who, who attempted to save Tutsi, suffered the same tragic fate. Then we could try to describe this big event, this major event, analyzing two different uh, killing dynamics that converge in the, during the spring of 1994. The first one is a vertical dynamic, uh, is embodied by the engagement of the state apparatus. And the second one is the an horizontal dynamic, uh, is represented by the popular dimension of the killings. And the combination uh, between this vertical and horizontal dynamic could explain the, the, uh, the outburst of violence. Approximately one million people we are killed in a very, very short time, less than three months. And the estimation of the perpetrators reaches 800,000 if we include the number of people who were condemned for looting. So if the vertical dynamic uh, of massacre seems not different from other cases of genocide, the popular dimension which characterized the Tutsi genocide is unprecedented. And here uh, we have to, to add and to stress that the grassroots perpetrators did not kill anonymous victims, but mostly their neighbors, their co-religionists, and sometimes their friends or members of their own families. The Tutsi genocide is striking by the proximity between perpetrators and victims. And the violence also destroyed all the social and affective bounds because it was executed with extraordinary cruelty. And this main characteristic of the event of the genocide were early considered by the new government led by the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the RPF, which was a political and military movement that put an end to the genocide and cite power in July 1994. After the genocide, uh, the new government faced with several options. The first one was divide the country, creating a Hutu land and a Tutsi land. This is an option which was suggested by some people from the UN and some people from the French government. Uh, the second option was to grant a general amnesty, and the third one, prosecute the perpetrators. The two first options were excluded, and Rwanda decided to prosecute and judge in order to fight against the impunity that had led to legitimize the genocide in 1994. But besides this penal dimension, this kind of justice also aims to make the people living again together in a new nation where Rwanda national values could be promoted. 
And this general politic of reinvent reinvention of the tradition explain in a part the idea to rely on gachacha courts. <coughs> but the main preoccupation of the government was to find a form of justice that could fit the way the crime had been perpetrated and to put the crime at the scale where it, ha it had been executed on the hills among the vicinities. Explaining the gachacha system at the, at the first begin at the beginning in, in 2001 in front of a crowd of uh, prisoners, uh, the Rwanda National Prosecutor states, your prosecutor will be your neighbor, your lawyer will be your neighbor, your judge will be your neighbor. Indeed, there are no lawyers and no professional judges in the gachacha. The gachacha judges, called Inyangam Gayo, which, which means a uh, honest person in Kinyarwanda, have been elected uh, among their community and they are often uh, eyewitnesses or uh, survivors of the genocide. <clears throat> Both victims and accused don't have the support of the lawyers uh, during the trials. So neighbors, uh, judge neighbors at the micro-local scale of the hills. From 2002, to 2012, more than 12,000 gachacha courts treated almost 2 million files related to the genocide. And here we have to, to, to notice that the participation in the, in the genocide takes on many varied forms, from killing to looting and denunciation. That explains the huge uh, number of files. So after these few words of general con con contextualization, I'd like to describe more concretely uh, the way gachacha trials works uh, in very concrete uh, terms, because it's very, very specific. And as I stated before, we face a very specific form of justice, especially created to fit the form of the genocide, the form of the crime. That's why it seems impossible to analyze separately the tribunals and the history of the genocide itself. So observing the Gachacha trial, we have to pay attention to the formal, formal exercise of the justice as well as the actors' testimonies. Indeed, common, form, common, common forms with the way genocide had been perpetrated influences the Gachacha framework. So we have to be attentive uh, to the justice framework in order to, um, to apprehend the crime itself. Firstly, uh, the Tutsi genocide was a, pub a public genocide. Killings uh, took place mostly outside and were followed by a crowd of curious encouraging killers. Its justice will be a public justice based on the participation of the population, sometimes the same population who encouraged to murder. During the hearings, many people insist on, the, on, on this public dimension of killings, which is part of cruelty. And in, the, in order to encourage wit witnesses to speak or in order to underline the victim's suffering. Secondly, this genocide, the Tutsi genocide, is characterized by its popular dimension, both having regard, regarding to number of perpetrators and uh, victims. But this popular dimension has to be also analyzed in its social forms if we consider uh, the jubilant surrounding of the massacres, above all the, the massive consumption of beer and meat of the cows which were lo looted to the, to the victim. So the justice will be also popular and massive and will, be, uh, and will fit into daily life of the inhabitant of the hill for one decade. And finally, and above all, the Tutsi genocide was a genocide of proximity and even, even more a genocide of intimacy, reaching the most intimate ties of the Rwandan society. So the justice will be a justice of proximity 
by gathering former neighbors, friends, and family into the tribunal. So <clears throat> after this brief presentation of the similarity between the crime and justice, I'd like to describe more concretely the way Gachacha uh, lead uh, trials. First of all, um, we have to physically enter the scene of justice, which is deeply rooted in the social and topographical places of massacres at the micro-local uh, level. Gachata courts are characterized by horizontality, both in regard of the actors and its formal organization. There is no transcendent, transcendent principle above it, no symbolic uh, ritualization. So the, the Gachacha session uh, were held on the, on the hill, on the grass, which is the etymology of the word Gachacha in Kinyarwanda, in the shade of trees in administrative buildings uh, or stadium. There were, there were no dedicated places for these trials. And more, more importantly, the Gachacha trials took place in the direct proximity of the places of killings. So the scene of justice is also the scene of crime. Judiciary space is far from being neutral, but it's, it, it's marked by the memory of the slaughters. Uh, many memorials marked, marked out the way the people had to follow in order to attend the hearings, the Gachacha hearings, and some are very explicit. As you can see in this, in this photographic, um, it records with brutality the memory of the genocide by exposing weapons. So this photography uh, had been uh, taken in a place called Mugonero. Mugonero is situated in the west of Rwanda on the bank of the Kivu Lake. And the Gachacha court, the Gachacha trials, took place few meters around it. So in this place, in Mugonero, a huge massacre occurred on Saturday 16th uh, of April 1994. It was an, an Adventist chapel and hospital, and several thousand of people died during this massive attack. And this is a man who lost all his family uh, during the genocide, who built the memorial in 2000. And this example of this photography aims to show that the space of justice is also a space deeply rooted in the memory of the genocide. Uh, here, it's another, it's another photography taken in Butamwa. Butamwa is a, not, a former commune near Kigali. Um, and this is the, the memorial for the victims uh, who were mostly killed during the first week of the genocide in a religious institution in the swamps and in the Nyabarongo River. And this memorial is quite modest, but situated just in front of the administrative building where Gachacha took place, which is here. here. <clears throat> so more, more striking, this scene of justice in Kivuye had been erected on the place of the killing itself. Uh, in April um, 18, 1994, approximately 10,000 of Tutsi refugees had been, were killed in the Gatwaro Stadium, here in this stadium. And 12 years after, the trials were held in the stadium and people could see the mass graves just in front of the bleacher. So here you have sin of massacre is the same of the sin of, of justice. So as you can see, we are far from Western spaces of justice based on a principle of distance. On the contrary, the space of the gachacha is characterized by the proximity with the event, physically rooted in the geography of the massacre. Uh, and I'd like to insist on this physical dimension insofar as the topography uh, played a very important part during the killing of 1994. In the trials, the actors reconstitute the, the geography of the genocide and place their testimonies in the physical environment, hill by hill, path by path, house by house. And because the gachacha are so deeply rooted in the topography, uh, 
The trials unveil the geography of the genocide, which is, which is so crucial to understand uh, the dynamic of the micro-local killings. Indeed, during the genocide, killers mobilize, mobilize their knowledge of the topography to increase the efficiency of the crime. The river, the forest, rock, field, road, and pit latrines represent so many weapons and places of killing and burials. We could add uh, churches. <laughs> That's why it's very important to describe and to keep in mind the physical environment uh, to uh, describe the scene of justice and the, the scene of the crime. I would like to, to continue to, con to, to conclude by the, the, an analysis of the, <coughs> the core of the scene of justice uh, and by explaining how the trials are internally organized. So the proximity I have underlined above is still very present in the internal organization of the Gachacha trials. So the gachacha, the space is not uh, materially ritualized. This is a tribunal. This is a gachacha tri tribunal. Uh, you, you, you will find no physical separation between the parties, especially accused and their victims, no symbols of transcendent justice. Uh, the, physical, the physical disposition of gachacha is very, very humble, as you can see on this photography. A table for judges, some benches, and people attend the trial sitting down on the grass in the shade of trees or umbrellas. There is absolutely no decorum except the judge's scarf with the national flag colors, as you can see in the other photograph. In this picture, in this picture you can see uh, the judges uh, the back um, and a woman, a woman who is a survivor, and this woman, the survivor is surrounded by two killers who participated in the killing of her three children. And as you can notice, they stand very close to each other with no physical separation. Placed donc, in a such uh, proximity, people can have direct interpolation and sometimes confrontation. And the scene of justice is also characterized by its fluidity, fluidity of the speech circulation, fluidity of the body's movement into the judiciary space, and fluidity uh, of the status among the tribunal. Uh, indeed, places are not allocated. Judges can join, can join victim or witnesses' benches during hearings, among, and among accused, an accomplice can be another accused. So role and status are not firmly assigned in the, in the gachacha. So this proximity, this big, deep proximity instituted among the actors on the trials can be analyzed as a continuation of their social and affective proximity before and during the genocide, and as a reflection of the intimacy of the murderers. So, as I stated above, the, the Tutsi genocide was mainly executed among vicinities. And in the Gachacha, vicinities and even families are gathered again to reconstitute all the sequences of the crime, from the tracking of the victim to the fate reserved to their, co their corpses. So, <clears throat> trials are deeply rooted in social and affective worlds. So the main criticism addressed to the gachacha system is also the condition of its implementation. Indeed, many human rights activists and even survive, survivors associations denounce the, in, the intimate relation between judges, accused, and witnesses. But in fact, from the experience I collected during my fieldwork in Rwanda, some judges explain their strategy to make people speak about the genocide by virtue of the knowledge they have them, themselves about the event. In the countryside, especially in the countryside, Gachacha judges are long-time inhabitants of the hill, so they are part of the vicinities. And this is a major point. Gachacha trials rely on a common knowledge shared by all the actors. Indeed, they all have deep, deep knowledge of the physical and social topography and then they can cross, 
they can <coughs> cross check, check, cross -check sorry, uh, the testimonies. They also share a deep consciousness of the large rank of social and cultural transgression that's, that occurred during the killings and some different strategy based on religious, religion function, age or gender are systemat systematically rejected. All actors uh, know that being a woman, a child, a priest did not put a break on killing as it did not constitute a protection against violence. That object lost their daily, daily insignificance but have been systematically categorized as weapon. Uh, in a trial, for example, an accused claimed he had a machete in order to cut corn plants and st straight after a woman stood up and said, we all know that in the time of genocide, machet machetes did not be used for cutting corn, but to kill people. After this woman raised this statement, the president of the Gachacha called this object a weapon machete. In Huaru Yimiro, in uh, including this daily instrument in the weapon sphere. So there will be many things to, to say about Gachacha, but um, I would like to, to say a few words to conclude. As an original judiciary process, Gachacha courts have been criticized from outside because it obviously did not fit the rule of a fair trial. But its singularity was also the condition of its implementation. The challenge for the, for the round after the genocide, the challenge was to find a way to account, account, to account for such no precedent crime, which was the Tutsi genocide. Thank you very much. Stéphane Audouin Rousseau's paper is titled Being a Witness in the Trials in France of Perpetrators of the Rwandan Tutsi Genocide. Since 2014, I have testified four times in trials conducted in France against perpetrators of the Rwandan Tutsi Genocide who had taken refuge in that country. The long period of impunity that they had previously enjoyed was ended by the work of two groups, the Collective of Civil Parties for Rwanda, CPCR, and the Crimes Against Humanity War Crimes <coughs> section of the Paris Court of First Instance created in 2012. These four trials are, first, the 2014 trial of Pascal Simbikangwa, sentenced to 25 years uh, in prison. Uh, second, the trial upholding that conviction on appeal in 2016. Third, the 2016 trial of the former mayor of Cabarondo, Tito Barahira. And fourth, the trial of the mayor in office in 1994, Octavian Ngenzi. Both Tito Barahira and Octavian Ngenzi were sentenced to life in prison, and that was upheld on appeal in 2018. Since the high-profile trials in the 1980s and 1990s in France, namely those of Claus Barbie in 1987, Paul Touvier in 1989 and 1994, Moïse Papon in 1998, the difficult question of the presence of researchers in the courtroom has been fully recognized by historians. In recent years, a new layer of experience has been added. International justice has immersed researchers in a common law judicial system as compared to the civil law system in France, thus generating new reflections. It is one thing to examine the academic literature on these judicial developments, however, and quite another to be directly confronted with them. Prior to my own experience of testifying before a criminal court, cour d'assises in French, I thought I knew all about the issue of historians and the courtroom and about the difficulty of their specific position in the judicial arena. I had talked a lot about it in the 1990s with Henri Rousseau, who provided a clear explanation of why he had refused to testify during the Papon trial. I felt that my position was close to his. A historian does not belong in the courtroom. But with the trial of perpetrators of the Rwandan Tutsi genocide who had taken refuge in France, nothing has gone according to plan. It is this experience that I would like to share here and on which I would like to reflect for a moment. <laughs> 
I will focus in particular on the first trial, that of Pascal Simbikangwa in February and March 2014. My role as a witness in subsequent trials stems entirely from that initial experience. Four months prior to the trial, I received a document delivered by a bailiff written in an archaic French. I was, quote, summoned to appear in person before the Assizes Court of Paris at the courthouse the 4th of February 2014 at 9.30 a.m. as well as the following days to give and tell the truth on the facts on which you have knowledge regarding the case against Pascal Simicangua, end of quote, charged with genocide and crimes against humanity. In a section titled, Very Important, it was stated, quote, you will be heard by the court after you have been sworn to tell the truth. I wish to inform you that failing to testify, unless you can prove that you were unable to do so, refusal to testify as well as perjury are punishable by law. Furthermore, if you fail to attend the hearing, the court may have you immediately brought before it by law enforcement officials, and you may be fined 3,750 euros, end of quote. On the spur of the moment, I had no taste for the unintentionally comical character of this text. Quite the contrary. I was filled with apprehension from the outset. And instead of subsiding soon afterwards, this feeling continued to grow until the day of my testimony. It was mixed with another feeling. For the first time, I felt what it meant to be a French citizen. Not from the point of view of rights, but from the point of view of duties. The threats that this call to the stand contained were edifying in that regard. Nonetheless, I had expected this summons from the prosecution, as had other social scientists. I had been engaged for several years in research on the genocide of the Rwandan Tutsi and on the role that France had played in that catastrophe. But it went without saying that I had nothing to say on the specific case of Captain Simbi Kangwa, having no access to the file. Furthermore, I do not consider myself to be a specialist of the Great Lakes region of Africa. In fact, if my presence was required on the stand, it was as a specialist on the extreme violence of the contemporary period. In short, as a generalist professor who was to explain to jurors the logic of the 1994 genocide and to challenge its common interpretation in terms of a quote-unquote inter-ethnic massacres which was an interpretation that could help to clear the accused who belonged to spheres of power of the charge against him. In other words, I was being asked to give a lecture, and that is where the difficulty lay. As a researcher, the focus of my interest in the 1994 genocide is the violence committed by neighbors, of which the Tutsi genocide represents an extreme case. But that was certainly not what I needed to talk about in court. Because on this point, the work of a researcher could have, with a little rhetorical skill and a lot of bad faith on the part of the defense lawyers, been used to construct the vision of a purely inter-ethnic and spontaneous violence entirely from below. This, again, could, could be of help to clear the leaders of the time of the charges against them. On the contrary, in this in the context of this trial, it was the ideology, the preparation, and the organizational role of the state that needed to be emphasized. The French procedure also required speaking without any notes, which was an important additional difficulty. Finally, the fact of having to testify under oath to tell the truth suddenly seemed absurd. It is a requirement which obviously makes no sense to a researcher. In short, after receiving this call to the stand, I began to really understand the controversy over the historian's place in the courtroom. However, contrary to what I had thought on a theoretical level, in practice, evasion was not an option for several reasons. Because it was about Rwanda. Because it was the first trial of a perpetrator, genocidaire in French, taking place in France 20 years after the events. Because this trial was the culmination of remarkable work from the Crimes Against Humanity section of the court, work that needed to be supported, because a more or less unchecked and more or less assumed negationism denial is spreading in France, this same France which had a shameful role in 1994. In the weeks that preceded the opening of the trial, I thus worked hard to prepare my general expose. I consulted many people also, trying to be as little surprised as possible by the ordeal that would unfold in the courtroom. In spite of this preparation, in days leading to it, 
the initial apprehension had turned into full-fledged anxiety. Anxiety about the judicial arena and its rituals. Anxiety about the questioning from lawyers of the defense. Anxiety about the journalist's gaze. But I was wrong there, as the, title, the trial did not have much coverage in the news, and my name hardly appeared in the court reports. Anxiety about the camera. I knew that all the proceedings would be recorded, a first in France. Anxiety about the audience's presence, in which colleagues, friends, and students would appear. Fortunately, once I had taken the stand, this anxiety suddenly disappeared. I had decided not to play the professor too much, so I started by saying that I was not an expert on Rwanda, but a researcher. I also said that in 1994, I had not paid attention to the reports of massacres in Rwanda, and that I had accepted without any critical distance the then widely shared thesis of an inter-ethnic massacre linked to an ancestral hatred between the so-called Hutu and Tutsi ethnic groups. In short, I claimed that I wanted to avoid giving lessons to anyone, as I had only made my first visit to Rwanda in 2008, or 14 years after the genocide, which is very late. What remained to be done afterwards was much less difficult. I developed three points, starting back from the idea that the massacre of the Rwandan Tutsi in 1994 had nothing to do with an ancestral inter-ethnic hatred, which had one day led to uncontrollable and widespread killings and to popular fury an interpretation that, again, could relieve the leaders of their responsibilities. No, the massacre of April, July 1994 had been a modern genocide that had to be linked to two other genocides of the 20th century, that of the Armenians in 1915 and that of the Jews of Europe in 1941 through 1945. And I stress the obviously fundamental fact that this third genocide had drawn from the same source as the two preceding ones, that of European racialism and racism as formulated at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. In that sense, the Rwandan Tutsi genocide of 1994 was not a distant, somehow specifically African event. It was, a very, it was very close to us Europeans just as it was for the genocide of the Armenians, and as it was for the genocide of the Jews of Europe. The genocide of the Rwandan Tutsi grew out of the same soil of an ethno-racial way of thinking, which came from far away. It was the last avatar of an ideology coming from Europe, before being profoundly internalized by Rwandan society for more than half a century, resulting in deep resentment, an essential element of all genocides. And, as in the other two genocides, the genocide of 1994 was inconceivable without its preparation by a state and without the means that only a state can mobilize in the service of a wide-scale murderous enterprise, tracking and keeping records of opponents, using armed forces, including regular army, state police, militias, mobilizing the local administration, prefects, mayors, heads of units, political leaders, and using the instruments of communication, written press, radio, to spread propaganda. The question of neighbors was a very delicate one for the reasons I mentioned earlier. I thus said that the genocide of the Rwandan Tutsi was unimaginable without the massive popular participation that characterizes it, and in particular the role of neighbors in hunting down and killing those with whom they cohabited. But I reminded the audience that in Rwanda, like elsewhere, neighbors did not set themselves in motion on their own it is thus clear that the representatives of state authority had played a crucial driving role, even if not following the same timetable everywhere. I emphasized the fact that a gigantic wave of pogroms spontaneously carried out during three months by neighbors on neighbors without any incitement from above was simply an absurd hypothesis for an historian of mass violence. For such a configuration never occurred in our contemporary period. And I finished by expressing my certitude that the genocide of the Rwandan Tutsi was a major event of our times. It was, to my mind, a slightly naive way of saying to the jurors that they had an immense responsibility. As I was talking, I was under the impression that I was being listened to very carefully, but with an extreme tension. The configuration of the judicial arena plays its role here. The presiding judge, his assessors, and the jurors were facing me and sitting up higher, a situation strictly opposite to that which I am used to in my profession. The prosecution was on my right, with the accused slightly behind me, on the left, in a glass cage. The lawyers for civil parties were behind my back. Those for the defense on my left, 
The witness feels surrounded as he remains standing, alone, without notes. This appeared to me a very unequal confrontation. After being questioned by the presiding judge and some jurors, it was the young lawyers for the defense's turn. I had been outraged by their prior statements to the press, and knowing that they would plead for acquittal, I wanted to fight them. I later realized that I was being stupidly naive. I was therefore very aggressive from the outset. After the very first words with one of the lawyers having exploited the impression Rwandan genocide, I responded as coldly as possible that there was no more a Rwandan genocide than there was a German genocide, and that he needed to change his vocabulary when speaking to me. I was very much determined to maintain an objectionable behavior, a stance made easier by the infuriating ballet of lawyers turning around me in a sort of a common law type cross-examination. I was su surprised that the surprising presiding judge did not remind me to respect the defense. Content-wise, the lawyers for the defense, without much imagination, it has to be said, tried to make things difficult for me on the grounds of the current political regime in Rwanda. It was not too difficult to answer that the massacre of 800,000 Tutsi had nothing to do with the Rwandan government policy. They acknowledged it. It was nevertheless very long, a little over two and a half hours. In the following weeks, I kept a little distance from the trial while being disappointed by the lack of media coverage. Then came release, less from the heavy sentence handed down than from the fact that acquittal, which was to be feared the most, had been avoided. Afterwards, I was able to have a deeper discussion with the Director of Public Prosecution for this trial, Deputy Prosecutor Olya Devou, who was also the Director of the Crimes Against Humanity War Crimes Section of the Court. The question was the following. What was at stake in such trial in the eyes of various researchers, in the eyes of magistrates, the lawyers from the Civil Party and the defense? For Olya Devou, whose role on the accusation side had been crucial, this presence of researchers in the courtroom had been the most intense and complicated meeting point. If, in the pretrial phase, the place of researchers in the witness list seemed obvious to her, she had, by the way, read their works very carefully, calling them to the stand appeared problematical nonetheless. She said that she was aware that calling a researcher to the stand obviously meant forcing him to expose himself. It was also reducing him to what was expected in the judicial arena, and which has little to do with his own conception of his profession and his social, even civic, role. It was also risky to see him being pushed around in public in a context that is not his own and that he undoubtedly does not control. Indeed, the hearing is often a first-time experience for him. There is, however, no guarantee that the researcher will be able to say what is useful in the courtroom considering that aside from his personal intuition, he has no real way of knowing. He is thus in a delicate situation when he enters the court. He has to defend his own analysis while facing the risk of being challenged, if not pushed around. With these initial scruples, Oilia de Vaux is no doubt right. The notion of ordeal used by a social scientist who testified before the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in an admittedly much more trying system of cross-examination of witnesses than the French system seems justified, especially since a large audience of researchers, colleagues, students, and journalists can, in their own way, judge the performance and disseminate their assessments outside the courthouse. To that difficulty can be added another substantial problem, one which is even more likely to place the researcher at a disadvantage. Olya de Vaux was indeed very aware in this pretrial phase that the researcher witness would become an instrument in the true sense of the word, simply because he had to be one because he was there to be useful. The researcher indeed comes to enlighten the court on the basis of a context, on what surrounds the facts, on what is not said, to give meaning, in sum, to the acts that are being judged. According to Olya de Vaux, the hope of sticking to facts detached from their context, historical context in this case, must be abandoned. No radical opposition can be drawn between context, history, a search for meaning, and simple factuality. Everything is connected. For example, distributing weapons, like Pascal Simbikangwa was accused of doing on the barriers in Kigali, takes on meaning only through its context. And only the social scientists, sciences can enable us to understand the dynamics with which one who gave the order may have been involved. 
The researcher, with his capacity to take a necessary distance, therefore plays a decisive role in the conception of the judicial responsibility of the court. The testimony of the researcher makes it possible to write down the guilt of the accused. Listening to the researcher, Oya Devo sums up, I had the impression of going up in a hot air balloon. By moving away from the facts, I understood them better. Olya Devo thus advocated in favor of the social scientists in such strong terms that the researcher himself would not even dare to use. By professional modesty, maybe. Also out of a doubt that is consubstantial to his or her own research. A doubt that this research itself, about this research itself, about its intrinsic value in a way, but moreover a doubt about the basis of a social usefulness that must be continually verified. It is in this sense that Aurelia de Vaux understands the idea that the presence and words of the researcher form an attestation, an attestation of the context, as we said, but also an attestation of the historical reality in a more general way. Lastly, it is rare, it seems to me, that the so imperfect knowledge of the social sciences should be so well received outside their own perimeter. And it is important to notice that such a welcome took place in a criminal court during the first trial in France of a Rwandan perpetrator, exactly 20 years after the perpetration of the last genocide of the 20th century. I would like to conclude, though, by expressing a few concerns. After the Simbikangwa trial in the first instance, I was required by the court to testify in three other cases the appeal trial of Simbikangwa and the trials in the first instance and on appeal of Tita Barahira and Octavian Ngenzi, the mayor in office and the former mayor, former mayor of Cabarondo. That is why I am very concerned about my probable return to the stand during all the trials that are to come. 25 cases are currently under examination by this section. There is a great risk of having to play in an almost mechanical way the role of a sort of a professional witness summoned by successive calls to the stand facing lawyers of the defense which we may fear will be increasingly better prepared. How can we avoid such a trap? As is often the case with the Rwandan Tutsi genocide, I have no answers. Good evening, and um, I have to say that my friend Joe Golson asked me to uh, do some conclusive remarks, which I'm not <coughs> really sure to, to be able to do. I'm not an expert at all on Rwanda, so what I'm doing here. So, uh, first, uh, I'm a French citizen, and I think today every French citizen could be concerned by what happened in Rwanda because France has been deeply involved in the genocide even before the genocide. Secondly, I'm a historian and a historian of the Holocaust and a historian on memory. And the Rwandan case is a very particular case for those who are working on the question of memory and memorialization. I will try to give you some, uh, some elements. Actually, I discovered Rwanda's history by reading uh, Hélène's PhD in 2013, meaning 20 years, almost 20 years after the, the genocide, and realized that I knew nothing about the last genocide of the 20th century, despite I was a historian on the field. And I learned then, and I, uh, I changed then completely my perspective, a little bit like Stéphane Edouard Rousseau, who was a, a colleague and a friend of mine, uh, on the idea of extreme violence. The genocide of the Tutsi wasn't just a state-driven crime, but also a mass crime extensively committed by ordinary people at a scale and with method simply unimaginable. As far as I can see, and Hélène will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I've heard and I've read that the numbers in, in, in Rwanda during the genocide, the numbers of victims was almost the same of the number of, of 
a uh, alleged perpetrator, which is a kind of unique situation in history of genocide. So um, it was a kind of a deep shock uh, for me. Uh, how has it been possible to ignore the magnitude of this genocide, especially as a French historian, while France was deeply involved in the process? Part of the answer has been given by uh, Hélène and by uh, Stéphane in this uh, the lecture uh, read, read by, by, by uh, Nathan. Let me add some elements of the context, uh, especially on the French context. Mm -hmm. In 1994, the French political and intellectual scene was going through a vivid, a very vivid debate on memory especially about the legacy of the Vichy regime and the haunting memories of collaboration and the genocide of the Jews. We have talked a little bit, the, 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 the question of the Tuvia trial has been mentioned a few times. The Tuvia trial was important, not because of Paul Tuvier, who was a small collaborator during the, during the Holocaust, but because it was the first trial in France against humanity, against a French perpetrator. The very first trial against humanity was against Klaus Barbie, who was a Nazi, who was an SS, but the French, the, the very first trial against the French perpetrator was done in 1994, exactly <coughs> at the moment where the genocide in uh, Rwanda started. This is, a, of course, a coincidence with, which play a major role to underline or to underestimate uh, by the uh, many historians, intellectuals, including politicians, the importance of what was going on in Rwanda, very far away from France. So, uh, and a few months later, in September 1994, while the world knew a little bit more about what happened in Rwanda, the attention uh, was focused again on the question of the Vichy legacy because of Mitterrand, the, the, the president, the, 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 the current president, the, the, the actual president of the Republic. Many people, especially from the younger, discovered that the socialist president of the Republic worked for a while for the Vichy regime in 1941, 1943, before, before founding the resistance movement and becoming a figure in post-war politics. This so-called revelation caused a scandal. Then, what is important to, important to understand here, that these controversies about the past were carrying on two major assumptions. First, the nation, France, as many other nations, especially in Europe, should remember its past, face the dark episodes of its recent history, and even implement a process of reparation or redress what actually France did a little bit. The second assumption was, like other nations all over the world, France should promote a duty to remember, a duty. This is a French expression, le devoir de mémoire, which I translate as a duty to remember, to, in order to avoid any kind of repetition in history. Never again, never again has been everywhere, but especially in France, uh, the obsessive motos of, motto of policies of memory since 1994. So there is a strange and even a, a huge contradiction. On the one hand, there was vivid debates about the memory of what happened in France 50 years, 40 years, 50 years before, and nothing was said about the genocide in Rwanda and nothing was said about the possible relationships between what happened in, in, in Europe and in France during the Holocaust and what was going on at the very moment in Rwanda. And this is a real, a real, a, a real problem. And the, well, I realize it like Stéphane and many others, that it could be uh, a strong, not to say the ultimate limit to the idea that contemporary societies can repair the past and that a process of remembering, of remembering could be an antidote to other crimes. Of course, it doesn't work. So then I have a, a, a second experience, thanks to uh, Hélène and Stéphane, like, like uh, Joe recently, I made two trips in Rwanda. Uh, and one in April 2014 during the uh, commemoration of the, the 20th anniversary of, of, of the genocide and the other one in April 2016. Uh, and there were terrible shocks again for many reasons. Uh, and here I will focus on the question of memory and memorialization, not in France, but in Rwanda. And uh, well, as a 
an expert, let's say, if I can say that I'm an expert on memory, I've, I've been working on the question of memorialization, I discovered things I never saw before anywhere. Uh, first, the obsessive present of the past, which is, of course, understandable after such a genocide, both at a high political level and the, in the everyday life. What uh, struck me a lot was the discovering of the very particular policies of memory that Helen knew a lot. Of course, she even worked a little, uh, she even worked on, on it uh, before doing her, her PhD on the gacha cha And uh, these uh, particular policies of memory changed my mind about the question of memorialization. When you go to Rwanda, and especially if you don't know the country, I, I mean, I was completely uh, ignoring this, this country, and I don't speak the language, of course, and I discover traces of the genocide 20 years after everywhere. You have in any village, uh, almost in any village, in every city, you have memorial showing skeletons, bone, skulls, human remains vitrify with lime, uh, like in uh, Murambi, for example, which is, is an, an incredible place to visit, especially if you come from abroad. So this was a difficult, a difficult physical experience as, as a visitor in me. And especially when you are accustomed to a very different process of memorialization, uh, meaning the question of the Holocaust, which is based not only in France, in, in general, in Europe, even at a global scale, the memory of the Holocaust has been mainly based on the idea that violence shouldn't be shown. I mean, the memorialization of the Holocaust is based on uh, um, the memory of the names, the memory of the victims, a kind of symbolization. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the debate launched by uh, the famous French filmmaker Claude Lanzmann saying you should not represent by images the Holocaust. It was a, it was a tremendous controversy with this film, I forgot the name, uh, uh, Schindler List. When Schindler List was released, it was a strong debate between the two, uh, between Spielberg, uh, Spielberg and, and Lanzmann on the issue, do we need to represent the Holocaust? Do we need, do, is it possible to represent violence at such a, a scale? In Rwanda, the uh, representation of, of the, the genocide is everywhere. You can even touch it by uh, physically. So I, I have no judgment about that, but this was for me a very strange and very new um, uh, experience on the question, on, the, on, on the, uh, an example of memorialization. And then I think one of the main issue, and then one more time, I'm not an expert on, on the Rwanda, this kind of a contradiction in, in this country, you can observe when you come from abroad. On the one hand, you have policies of memory and policies in public policies in general aiming uh, to uh, uh, foster policies of reconciliation, which is, a, of course, a basis for uh, uh, this country to, to, to live again and to be able to live again after the, the, the genocide. On the other hand, you have these policies of memory which have a kind of a traumatic dimension underlining again and again the extreme violence that burst decades ago. A trauma is something you just remember all the time. Usually in policies of memory, you avoid to, uh, come on there, to maintain the trauma. You try to, to calm it a little bit down. In Rwanda, it's the contrary, and it's a very strange experience. One more time, when, when you come from abroad. So how to combine an obsessive remembering of the crime with the necessity to forget, to forget a little bit in order to close the wounds. I mean, if you have a policy, in any, in any case in history, if you, if you have a policy of reconciliation, for example, after a civil war, you need a little bit to forget what happened, a little bit. In the case of one that you have this huge contradiction, the obsessive present of the past, and at the same time, a policy of reconciliation, which seems to work, I mean, as, as far as, as I can see. So, and I will finish with the, some few remarks about why is it interesting for uh, a historian like me uh, 
uh, and with people who are not expert on, on the Rwanda, why is it interesting to study and to have a kind of an idea to, to what was going on in, in, in Rwanda? And here I would like to uh, emphasize what, what happened to me as a historian of, of the Holocaust. Uh, first, I had to re evaluate some of the situation, some of historical situation I work on before going to Rwanda. And this is exactly what Elens tried to, 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 uh, to explain about the, the, the role of the, the population, the ordinary people who, who participated to, to, to the genocide. I just realized as a historian, and because I work mainly on France and on the West, the Western part of Europe, that during the Holocaust, we didn't have such a kind of uh, popular violence against the Jews. You had this kind of violence in, uh, in Ukraine, you had it in the in, in USSR, you had it in Poland, you had it in Greece, in Salonika. You hadn't this kind of violence in France, Belgium, or... So this is very interesting to, to compare. I mean, interesting. This is a, important to understand and to compare the difference between a state-driven genocide and another kind of genocide where the population itself is completely involved in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the killings. This is one of the points. The other point could be a little bit controversial. I mean, I've been raised as a historian in the idea that the Holocaust was a uniqueness, was unique, there was no comparison possible. When you go to one, you just forget this kind of a uh, perception because uh, the, uh, what happened in Rwanda is in certain perspective exceptional. Exceptional, why? Because you have a situation where almost, I don't know, between 800,000 and 1 million people were killed in three months. In three months. So you, you can have a kind of an average of how many people were killed a day. So it's completely different from the Holocaust, except from some moments in, in, the, uh, in World War II, especially in Hungary. So this is a very particular situation you have to compare. If you want to, uh, to, to, to sustain the idea that the Holocaust was unique in history, at least you have to compare it. You have to compare to, to be able to affirm and to say, absolutely, there is no absolute comparison with the Holocaust with other genocide. And with the Rwanda case, to my, to my point of view, I mean, uh, I change a little bit my, my mind. And then I want, I'd like to finish uh, this uh, statements about the, um, uh, what, the question of historians uh, before a court. This has been a debate for a long time. So, and here I would like to emphasize one point which has been said by Stefan, but probably it's not under completely understandable by an American audience, if I, if I can may. I mean, what is important here, it's the French situation. The French legal system is completely different from the American one. And for example, and this is one of the reasons why I declined to testify at the Papon trial. When you are an expert, let's say a historian or a social scientist or whatever, uh, you come at the bar and you swear to say the truth, only the truth, and all the truth. Okay, this, this, you have to do that. This is the, the rule. But at the same time, you don't have access to the documents. You're an expert completely blind without the documents because in the rules, in the uh, uh, French criminal uh, uh, code proceeding, the, uh, a testimony, uh, a witness, pardon, a witness don't, doesn't have access to the documents, to the file. So this is exactly what, what Stefan was saying. This is a complete unequal situation between the parties. So, and they, well, at the same time, for the Holocaust, for the Rwanda, and probably for other cases, you had to do it. That's one of the contradictions of, of historian, of ex. You have to do it. How can you avoid, if you know something about such an event and you call by the court, how can you say, no, I don't want, I'm not interested. No, you have, probably you have to go. And then I would like to finish on one thing. What is an expert in such situation, and especially where, when the trial is a, occurring very far from the criminal scene, which is one of the elements here. And here there is a comparison between the trial uh, which he, uh, was, uh, we had in, in France in the 90s against the, uh, the Nazi perpetrators and the collaborators and what happened in Rwanda. They have a common point, not just the question of crime against humanity or genocide, which is the, the juridical qualification. They have a common point. The common point is, on the one hand, uh, the trial against Paul Touvier, Maurice Papon were dealing with an event very far away in the time. 
in the court during the Papon trial, only Maurice Papon, the defendant, and some of his victims were aware about what happened during the war. All the other uh, stakeholders, actors, were completely ignorant. They were born after the, the war. So in this situation, the role of the historians is to provide a context, a historical context, which the court doesn't have. So this is a real difficult task. I mean, you have to replace an experience which is usually uh, required by a jury. You, you have the experience, you're living at the same time than the defendant and, and than, the, than, than, than the victims. Here, you have to judge something which happened in the past, 50, 40, 50, may, may, sometimes 60 years after. So this is one of the difficulties. And why, this is why the, the role of the historians in particular particularly difficult. Rwanda, it's not the same thing. Rwanda, it happened 20 years before when the trials uh, began in, in France, so in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s. So here, there is another difference. It's too far. You take the, uh, the last, for example, the last trial uh, against the uh, Hutu perpetrators. The only people who knew the scene, who knew the country, who knew the country were the perpetrators, the victims, and some of the experts, especially Hélène, who's, let's say, the leading expert in France about the Wanda, all the others didn't know anything about Wanda. So this raised a question about the trial itself, about the absence of stat, and I'm in favor of it, and it's not a question of judgment, but the, 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 the absence first of statute of limitation for crimes against humanity or for genocide. And the other thing is, is with the, I'm, I'm not sure to, to have the good name, in, the good word in English, the universal competence. I mean, you can judge, uh, you can judge a Hutu perpetrator in France for crimes he committed in Rwanda. And this is a huge evolution of our juridical system and even about our relation to the past, to the history and to the present. That's why the Rwandan case is so interesting and so important. Thank you. I, I'm hoping that you all can you all hear me. I'm mic'd up. Okay. Um, there are a couple. Of there are a number of really fascinating questions here. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all of them. I will be a bit presumptuous and point, answer one of the questions: that in France, what was the role of France essentially in Rwanda in the past? For France, Africa represents an extraordinarily important. I don't want to call it a remainder of the colonial um, period but it is an, an, uh, a sphere of influence that is extremely important to the French. As far as Rwanda goes, it was originally a German colony, if I'm not mistaken, and then it was taken over by Belgium after World War, uh, World War I, when German colonies were taken back. The other point I'd want to make, which is something in my own reading about the genocide that I found absolutely fascinating, and that is, is that the distinction between Hutu and Tutsi was essentially institutionalized by the Belgians. They are the ones who impose the carrying of identity cards with Hutu or Tutsi marked on it, which the killers then made them produce so they'd know who to kill and who not to kill. In terms of ra any kind of racial differences, some of these are, all, in all cases of, of racial prejudice, such as the Holocaust, these are always exaggerated for effect. In fact, it's often extremely different, and certainly in, among Rwandans to tell who's a Tutsi and who's a, a Hutu. So that's a little bit of the background. France's role is extremely complicated. I wanted to, one of the other questions that I wanted to ask Hélène is, what is the precedent for the uh, Gachacha courts? Was there another um, legal precedent that they used? Uh, not really, because Gachacha courts, uh, they were, literally reinvented after the genocide. They are the justice of the genocide. And the process was closed in two, uh, 2012. Uh, it was the justice for the genocide. But before the genocide, it was a, a social mechanism to resolve some conflict about lands or cattle. cattle. But it, it, was, it was not um, a social practice a current social practice, uh, a common social practice uh, before the genocide. So it's very important to, to think that it was reinvented uh, just after the genocide. Uh, 
to uh, account for, for this crime. Okay. Um, I'd like to read a question of the ones, as I said, there are a number of interesting questions. We are close to out of time. This, I don't know who wrote this, but it's a wonderful question. While in Rwanda in 2011, I met a man, a Tutsi, who was ostracized by his Tutsi neighbors who thought he was a turncoat or a coward because he was not killed in the genocide. He was essentially a man without a country. Was his situation unique, or were many Tutsi alienated for not having been killed? Oh, that's a complicated uh, situation. Um, we we must we must know that uh, it, it, it uh, in Rwanda the the social situation is is very complex. Now in Rwanda, until the genocide, there are no Tutsi, there are no Hutu. Uh, the the mansion are are not publicly after the genocide. After the genocide. Uh, there are no two, no to see uh, on the IDs and public mention of ethnicity uh, is prohibited by the by the new government. Actually, they are not ethnic ethnic uh, Hutu and Tutsi are not e ethnical group because they share the same lang the, the same language, the Kinyarwanda, the same bi uh, religious belief, and the, and the same territory for for many uh, many centuries. Uh, now in Rwanda, you can find some people who define themselves as Tutsi, but they are not uh, necessary survivors because they were uh, refugees in neighboring countries because there were a lot of uh, pogrom against the Tutsi during the 60s. Uh, so you have so many uh, historical experiences in Rwanda. So maybe sometimes there are some suspicious uh, ideas about survivors because some people who returned fr uh, from their exile, they said, ah, how, how, um, how do you manage to, 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 to survive? Maybe you, you collaborate with the, with the Hutu or something like that. Uh, but it's not very common. It's not very common. But you must know that there are, there are no Tutsi and Hutu. You have many, many uh, different uh, historical experiences. And among Hutu, it's very important to, uh, to say, to stress that uh, not all Hutu participated in the genocide. Uh, there are some who deliberately s decide to save the people, and some, of, some Hutu died for that. So when you hear the Tutsi of the genocide, done by the Hutu, it's very, it's very shocking. It's not, it's not um, the, good, the, the good way to, to, to speak about this event. Okay. Uh, we had one question about whether was the Rwandan genocide unique. And since you've raised the question of whether the Holocaust was unique and mentioned that debate, from your experience, how do you see it? Well, I will give this usual answer. Every genocide is unique. So. Uh, but this is not enough. Uh, yes, I mean, again, I'm not an expert, but I think there are some very particular elements in Rwanda that makes it a uh, singular, let's say, not unique, but at mm. least singular. The role of the population, what, what Ellen said, I mean, a, which is completely different of what you saw during the Holocaust. Again. If you compare with the situation in 1941-42 in Ukraine with the uh, uh, occupied Soviet Union, you will, you will have mass murders, uh, you will have part of the population participating to the mass murders and the killings of the Jews. You won't have that at all in Western Europe. So the, even the Holocaust is not just a, a unique genocide. It's very different if you, you deal with the French situation, if you deal with the Ukrainian or the, uh, uh, the, the Polish situation. There is, in a certain sense, no comparison possible, except the fact that this is the same perpetrator, of course, the, the third eye. So, and uh, also, it's the time. I mean, so many people killed in such a few, uh, a, a, a three months, it's simply unbelievable be, because it, I mean, when you're accustomed to work on, on, on the Nazis, on the Holocaust, you're looking immediately for the organization, for how it, was it possible to kill so many people in three, four, in three or four years, half of the Jewish population of Europe, almost. So 
And then you find immediately, and we found it a long time ago, that there was an organization, it was parties, it was the army, whatever. In Rwanda, it's completely different. They had to organize it, or maybe it was prepared before, but they did it so quickly, so quickly that, well, this is my opinion, it's impossible to have such an, a scale of victims without the participation of so many people, not just the state, the army, or even the, um, the, the militia, the, uh, the inter yeah. way. So th this is, well, then you can have another question. Is it different from other massacres in Africa or whatever? Yes, I think it is. It's a genocide. It's not just a mass crime. There was a del deliberate way to kill part of the population with some uh, concrete identified criteria, even if it's not uh, uh, ethnically justified to speak about uh, um, Hutus and Tutsi. Well, when I was there, for example, I had this feeling that most of, not the young people probably, but the, the elder, the, the oldest, they knew who was Tutsi and who was so-called Hutu. How? This is a, it reminds me even my own experience as a Jewish people. They, they know, I don't know why, because they have some elements, the language, the experience of the discrimination or whatever. So there is the experience of to be discriminated in Rwanda, mm -hmm. which is very particular. I think we've probably run out of time. I just want to mention that there, I know that um, Leslie Rule, the associate director of the Scowcroft Institute, is organizing a follow-up because this is just tipping the iceberg. And I think the, the next time that we have a Rwanda event, part of the intention will be, of course, to bring Rwandans who have either experienced it or who um, have had family members experience and bring them here. So think of this as just the first stage of hopefully what's an ongoing discussion about a country that, as I mentioned, was one of the most moving and beautiful places I've ever seen. With that, let me thank you all for coming. We'll see you soon, I hope. Thank you.